Well, good morning, Lake Church family. I long to be able to do that uh, in person uh, soon, and we'll look forward to those days when we come together uh, again formally to worship. Corporate worship is something we miss so much, along with all of the other things this crisis seems to have taken from us. But we are grateful to know that just like the tomb was temporary, so is this crisis. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Morning. We're glad that you're joining us through Facebook Live. If you haven't already, reach out to somebody, invite them to join us uh, in this time of worship. We had a, a beautiful sunrise here at the camp and God has already shown us great favor and blessing. And we're grateful as always to know that this is the day that he has made. Let me give you a couple of words of instruction, let you know of a few things that'll be going on uh, during this service. Uh, we will be having communion. Now, those that were local, we were able to go out yesterday. Tiffany worked hard to try to get these little um, disposable communion packets. It uh, has the, the wafer and the juice, sort of an all-in-one thing. So if you've gotten that, great. And if you didn't, find some juice and some bread. Uh, God knows uh, your heart. It's not about the sacrament, exactly what it is, but, uh, but what it means to you and me and our hearts. So we'll do that at the end of our time together this morning. And also, I'm so grateful that we have some music this week. Takes a little bit uh, of, of technological savvy, uh, but there will be a, about a 15-minute uh, praise session that will be posting to our Facebook page and our YouTube page. And we're grateful for Vanessa and the Ussery Gang uh, putting that together. Know that that'll be a great blessing. So at the conclusion of my message, uh, you'll have that to look forward to. And uh, that will be great. Thank you for how you continue to faithfully support uh, the work of the Lake Church in the camp. Thank you for financially giving online and then also those that have dropped things by the camp if you're local. We just ask that you'd continue to be faithful in that and to trust God that he'll continue to meet every need. So we're grateful for that and also for how God's using uh, this uh, downtime, if you will, to get the word out about the church and the camp. We're meeting people every day through our morning devotions and every week through our Facebook Live messages. Help us by sharing these links and reaching out and letting people know uh, we are seeing people literally from all over the world watch uh, our little videos. And I am so humbled by that and grateful. So pray that God would continue to show his favor and blessing upon the ministry in these different days. So we'll look forward to that and to all that God's going to do. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 23, uh, an unusual place for us to be uh, beginning our study anyway on Easter Sunday, but I think you're going to see it's very, very fitting. So the Bibles are open, Psalm 23, number three, one little phrase we're going to be looking at. Would you pray with me and for me? Father, thank you so much for this morning that we celebrate Easter, the resurrection, the fact that we have a living Savior for the picture of the empty tomb and what that means, the victory that we have because of the death burial and resurrection of our Lord. Father, this morning I pray that you would use this brief time that we have together. Thank you for the miracle of technology. I pray that your hand would be upon this service. You would give unction, that you would give understanding, and that you would give, Lord, a sense of urgency that we would go and we would apply that which we will learn today. God, I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that you would touch hearts that you would open minds and that you would radically change lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He uh, said very clearly, because of this, I shall not want. We have a Savior that meets our needs, a Savior that floods our soul with his provision. Verse 2 he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And here's that phrase we were talking about earlier. He, the shepherd, the Lord God Almighty, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, our Messiah, our risen Savior on this Easter morning, David said, it is he that restores my soul. Why did Christ go to the cross? 
Why, why was Christ's body put in a borrowed tomb? Why did Christ have to go and defeat death, hell, and the grave? Why did Christ have to be resurrected? Because your soul and my soul and the very soul of every man, woman, boy, and girl depended upon this one act of redemption and sacrifice. So today we're looking, Easter 2020, He restores my soul. There are two main characters of the Easter story. Number one, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, He's not only the hero of the Easter story, but He's the hero of the eternal story, of the life story. He's not only the main character of the Bible, He's the main character of the earth. He's not only the one that came and lived a sacrifice, sacrificial life and let and live the historic life but he's the one that continues to live on today not only through the resurrection power but by the indwelling presence of the holy spirit of god so i'm grateful to know that my savior is the great character of this story but there's another character another main character if you will and that's you and that's me the bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of god they're none righteous no not one so the sinner those of us who were born sinners, we understand that we play a major role in the Easter story. There was a Savior because there was a sinner. Because of the need of the sinner, the Savior came to earth. Think about this. The Savior, He is the Redeemer and the sinner, you and I, we are to be and we are the redeemed. Let's look at the word redeem, R-E-D-E-E-M. What does that really mean? I looked it up and the definitions are twofold. Number one, to compensate for the faults of another. Number two, to purchase or to reclaim something for a required payment. I cannot think of a more appropriate word when we establish the relationship between the Savior and the sinner than to simply say, redeem. He compensated for my faults. He took upon himself my sin debt. He took upon himself my payment, my penalty, my very death. My sins were heaped upon his back so that his righteousness might be placed as a robe upon mine. Think about this. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, But he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, was wounded. Now stop there. This is a word of prophecy. 700 years before the cross, Isaiah said he has already been crucified. It is written in the pages of history. The word prophecy means history of the future. I learned that many years ago. It's important we understand that when the word of prophecy is written, it's as good as has done, but Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, yours and mine. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah continues and he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Remember, we're talking about the relationship between shepherd and sheep. All have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on Christ the iniquity, listen, of us all. A-double-L. We'll be looking at that word a little more in just a moment. Isaiah's prophecy says it was by his stripes that the sinner met the Savior and the Redeemer redeemed that which was lost. It's an amazing picture of the grace of Almighty God. Matthew chapter number 18, over in the New Testament, we see another great example of this. The Bible says this, if a man, in verse number 12 of Matthew 18, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? In other words, not only does the Savior die to redeem the sinner, but when the redeemed of the Lord, the sinners who are saved by the grace of God, go astray, he doesn't just say, well, I've had it with you, I'm done. But he says, no, you are my beloved. You are my redeemed. And because I loved you and paid such a price for you, not only do I redeem you by paying your sin debt, but when you go astray, I redeem you. I go, I reclaim you as a father looking for the lost son, as a shepherd looking for the lost 
sheep. I love the word redeemed. In fact, ultimately, above all the other titles that could be given to you and to me, I'm grateful to know that I one day will stand before the God of eternity simply with one name upon my head. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Let me share with you the gospel story. You know there was a cross, a trial. They could not find fault in this man. But nonetheless, he was sentenced to die. The choice was Barabbas or Jesus. One would be free. They said, give us Barabbas. And I said, well, what should I do with Jesus? And the very voices that had coronated Christ a week earlier said, crucify him. And he went to the cross for you and me. Six hours he would spend finally crying out, enough, it is finished. His body taken down, given to Joseph of Arimathea, placed in a borrowed tomb. And early on the third morning, Here's what happened. Verse 20 or chapter 24 of Luke's gospel, verse one. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Two times someone brought myrrh to Jesus. One was the wise men. The second were the women coming to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away and the sepulcher now empty. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And the Bible said, and they were afraid. They bowed their faces to the earth and they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? That's the most powerful phrase, I believe, in all of the New Testament. Many today believe that Jesus was a great teacher, a great prophet, a great miracle worker. He did things like no other man did, but they missed the point. He's not a dead Savior laying in a tomb. He is a risen Savior seated at the right hand of God the Father. The angel said, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember? How he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, must be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what we celebrate here today, Easter, that Jesus rose from the grave. And that what, that's what makes him Savior. That's what makes him redeemer. Back to Psalm 23. How do we connect David's psalm, David's panic psalm, David's peace psalm, David's praise psalm? David said, Lord, you restore my soul. Much like David, you and I find ourselves in situations where our soul needs to be restored. Our strength needs to be gathered. Our minds and our hearts and our lives need encouragement. We literally need restoration from the ground up. And I'm thankful to know of that ground that is level at the foot of the cross where the redeemed of the Lord are welcomed and to come and to return. Let me give you two examples in the Bible of this amazing restoration process. And by the way, there are many, many others. The whole Bible is a book of restoration and rescue and even revival. But two that stood out as I was praying and thinking about this passage. The first is again from David, Psalm 51. David says in verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God. Why did he need mercy? David, the man after God's own heart who could have had anything in his beck and call, chose to go for something that was not rightfully his. You know the story. He sinned with Bathsheba having an affair, committing adultery, and then lies and finally murder, trying to cover it up, having Uriah put on the front lines of battle and he would be killed. And, and it looked as though he had gotten away with it. In fact, David even looked noble because then he took the poor widow into his own home to care for her. I mean, he looked like he was on top of the world. 
They probably named a, a new holiday after him for something so noble as this. But there was a problem. While everything on the outside was covered up, what was on the inside was being torn apart. The very heart of David was breaking. He was in anguish when he closed his eyes at night. He could see the face of Uriah. When he opened his eyes in the morning, he could no longer see the face of God. The torment was upon him. And he said, God, have mercy upon me. I'm just an old sinner, but I'm a redeemed sinner. Who loves my Savior. Who loves my Redeemer. Oh God hear me. Here's what he said. According to thy loving kindness. And according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. God I've sinned before man and God. You and you alone can blot this out. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression. And my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. God I deserve your wrath. God I deserve literally torment. Because of what I've done. But I'm begging you oh God for mercy. David said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's our story. Behold, that was our in truth and in inward parts and in the hidden parts make me to know wisdom. Purge me, O God, with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Think about this. The very king of Israel no longer can experience joy and gladness. You may be there today and you say, you know what? I, I know that I'm a Christian but I don't have the peace of Christ. I, I know that I'm a believer but I don't have the joy of a believer anymore. There's no sense of, con uh, of connectedness with the Holy Spirit of God. Within me I am broken. David said that. He said because the bones... That you have broken. I beg you that they would rejoice again. Hide thy face, O God, from my sins and blot out all my, my iniquities. Listen, create in me a clean heart. O God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, nor take thy Holy Spirit from me. And here it is, verse 12. Restore. Remember, we're talking about the restorer. He restores my soul. David says, O God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways. Then sinners shall be converted. David is begging for restoration. And when we look at, at, at the very attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to Calvary's cross to restore us, maybe today you're, you, that, that you would agree with David and say, Oh God, I need my joy restored. I need my peace and my strength restored. What a beautiful picture of an Easter miracle that would be. There's only one that can restore our soul. You can go to the doctor and they might restore some of your beauty. Uh, you, you might be able to go to the clinic and get something on the outside restored, y'all. But there's only one who can restore the very soul of man. It doesn't matter how much makeup you put on the outside. It doesn't cover up what's on the inside. It doesn't matter how much physical exercise you do. It can't cure when there's brokenness on the inside. Only Christ can restore our soul. That's the Old Testament example. But let me give you a New Testament example. It's found in Luke 15. You know the story. I want to paraphrase it. A man had two sons. The eldest son and the youngest son. The youngest son was rebellious. Went to his daddy and said, Daddy, I want my inheritance now. I want to go and live it up. And live it up he did. The Bible says that he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he finally came to the end, he was literally down in the pig pen, uh, sharing a meal with pigs. And he looked and he said, This is no place for me. I have a father who loves me. I have a father that I believe would take me and at least make me as one of his servants. So he got up from the pig pen and he made his way back. And, and beyond his wildest imaginations, not only was the father willing to receive him as a servant, but the Bible says when the father saw his son yet a long way off, that lets us know the father had been looking. The father had been hoping. The father had been praying. The father had been patiently waiting waiting, even wondering if his son was even alive or dead. And he saw him coming. And the Bible says the father didn't wait for the son to knock at the door, but the father went after him. He leaped up into his arms. He fell upon him, kissed him on the neck, put a robe on his back, a ring on his finger, and shoes on his feet, literally saying, 
You are still my boy. You've failed me miserably. You've rebelled against me. You've embarrassed our family. You've done things to bring shame. But at the end of the day, you were dead. You're now alive. You had hurt me, but I love you in spite of it. Friend, can I tell you, I'm thankful to know that we have a Redeemer that does not just cast us off, whether it's David in the Old Testament or the prodigal in the New Testament. We see the passion of the one who restores my soul. He wants to restore that relationship. He wants to restore that joy. How can he do that? Because there's an empty tomb. Because he buried our sins in the depths of the sea, casting them as far as the east is from the west. Yes, he can restore your soul today. Let me close with the personal invitation. If you still got your Bibles open, Matthew chapter 11. You say, well, how does this all work? I want my soul restored. Well, first off, before your soul can be restored, you first must experience redemption. So understand that you can't restore that which has never been born. You cannot revive that which has never been alive. You can go over to the department store and find you a mannequin and you can do CPR. You can do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. You can shock that thing from here to kingdom come. But that mannequin is never going to be revived. That mannequin is never going to come back to life because that mannequin has never been alive. And many people say, well, I'm going to read this book or I'm going to take this class or I'm going to go through whatever it might be. And I just want to see my life revived or my life restored. But the problem is you've never experienced life in Christ. The Bible says that Jesus came to give life, life eternal, life abundant. You and I must accept Christ on his terms. Not simply say, God, take my life and kind of tweak it. God, you can't have it. You can have little bits of it, but God, it's basically my life. No, no, no. The Redeemer, He purchased you. Remember the, 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 uh, the definition of the word redeemed? He purchased you. That means you and I belong to Him. That means we have to be fully surrendered to Him, understanding that the title of our life, look up at the ownership and it says God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So first, I must be redeemed. Well, how do I do that? Isn't the cross enough? Isn't the grave enough? Isn't the empty tomb enough? Isn't the ascension of Christ enough? No, it's not enough. A gift is given, but a gift must be received. Jesus offers you a gift today. I can't offer it. The church can't offer it. Only the Redeemer can offer redemption. The Bible says if we believe, not only in our mind, but in our heart, and we confess with our lips the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall be saved. What an awesome picture of redemption. I was lost, but yet I can be saved. So that is the experience of salvation. Let me just pause and say if you've never done that and the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you, don't complicate it. The Bible says it's so simple a child cannot understand. In humility, call out to God, I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus came to this earth living a perfect life. He died on a cross for me to pay my sin debt. I accept that gift of eternal life right here and right now. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me. Make me white as snow. You take over my life. You're now the Lord of my life. You're the Savior of my life. Save me, oh God, and thank you for that. God looks, can, can interpret the very groanings of your spirit. You say, well, I don't know how to pray eloquently. We'll talk about a thief on the cross in a moment. All he knew to say was, remember me. But Jesus knew the intent of his heart. So that's the redemption process of salvation. The act of salvation that takes place when a sinner becomes a saint because of the, the, because of the saving grace of God. But what I want to talk about just for the next few moments that we have remaining before we take communion is what David meant when he said, restore my soul, both in Psalm 23 and in Psalm 51. 
And this is where many of us are today. We're going to heaven when we die, but we're going through hell on earth now because of decisions we've made, because of, of detours that we've taken, because of the roads that we've traveled, or even like the prodigal, because of lives that we seem to have wasted. And you say, well, I believe that God must have given up on me by now. Old friend, He hasn't. He hasn't given up on you. He can restore your soul. How do I know? Matthew chapter number 11. We'll close with this passage and a couple of comments. Jesus says, come unto me. He's the only one that can give that invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and I am lowly in heart. And you shall find, here it is, rest, to your souls. Does that sound familiar? He restores. Look at the word rest. He gives rest to my soul. There are many today that no matter how much sleep they get, they cannot get enough. No matter how many pills they take, they'll never be enough. No matter how many drinks they take, they'll never be enough. No matter how many relationships they have, they'll never be enough. No matter what they do, they'll never be enough because they've never experience the grace of God or maybe they drifted from that intimate relationship that only the King of Kings and Lord of Lords can come and give rest to our soul. Listen friend, you can sleep 23 and a half hours a day and your soul will still be weary. You can do everything in your power and your soul will still experience fatigue day in and day out. So let me give you this. Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Boy, it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Let me give you my peace, he says, in the midst of your calamity. Let me give you my calm in the midst of your storm. Let me just give you a couple of things down here from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. We don't have time to get into the whole text, but here it is. This connects Psalm 23 with the Easter story and then right there where you and I are today. First, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. And then there's a great big word, all. All. Two things. Number one, there's an invitation from Christ. And then there's an invitation to Christ. The word come, he's saying, I give you permission. I'm asking, I'm issuing this personal invitation. He knows you by name. He knows the plans that he has for you to prosper you and favor you and give you a, a very good end. The only way you can have a good end of the story is for your soul to be restored. So there's that personal invitation. But number two, there is an inclusion. There's an invitation and then there's an inclusion. Now listen, the church through the years has become very exclusive. Well, if you're going to come to our church, you better look a certain way. You better act a certain way. You better dress a certain way. You better like a certain kind of music or a certain kind of style or a certain kind of worship because we're pretty exclusive around here. You know, it's funny as you drive out through the country, you'll see some churches and their parking lots will have uh, Mercedes and BMW and Lexuses out there. And, and, and then you go and there's another church and there's a bunch of old pickup trucks and, and, and beat up station wagons. And you think, you know how, how churches kind of come together and they kind of represent a certain socioeconomic uh, group or a certain racial group or a certain ethnic group or a certain background. There's country churches and, and city churches and all of these things. But I want to tell you that God is no respecter of persons. He says, come unto me all ye. I love being called a whosoever because I get found right in the midst of John 3, 16, for God so loved the whosoever that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but that whosoever might have everlasting life. There's an invitation that is inclusive. Let me give you this. There's a lot of argument about these uh, things today. Did Jesus die for everybody or did Jesus just die for the elect or the select or the predetermined or the predestined? The problem with this is if Jesus died to predestine some for heaven, then by default he predestined some for hell. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. This ought to settle it for once and for all. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering was not what, what his long suffering toward us was not willing that listen, any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So here's the best illustration in the Bible for the inclusion of the grace of God. Jesus hung on a cross with his arms stretched wide. To his left, a criminal guilty of his crimes. To his right, a criminal equally guilty of his crimes. There was a conversation between Jesus and each. One of those criminals, those malefactors, the Bible says, said, if you're really who you say you are, why don't you save yourself and save us too? He rejected the grace and the gift of the cross. He was that close to it, but he rejected it. The other criminal just simply said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognized something about this man, Jesus. Even though he didn't have decades to serve Christ, he never gave the first tithe check. He never sang the first song. He never taught the first class. He never went on the first mission trip. But he simply said, remember me. I believe the grace of God was on full display. I do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ looked one way and said, Buddy, this is for you. And then looked the other way and said, But buddy, this is not for you. I believe the invitation was given both equally in each direction. One chose to accept, right? one chose to reject. There are people watching this video even now and you're making a decision. Will I accept or reject? Listen, friend, and truth is truth and grace is grace and a gift that is given is given in spite of whether or not it is received. I'm grateful for the atoning grace and the gift made possible at Calvary's cross. I heard it once said that the Lord Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He does not force himself upon anyone, but he offers grace to us all. Matthew 11, the invitation for restoration of our soul. Come unto me all. If you're lost out there today, you can be saved. The gift of the cross was for you. If you'd have been the only person in need, Jesus would have gone to that cross. But if you are saved, and like David, your soul needs restoration. You're broken, you're bitter, you're hurting, you're angry, or a thousand other things. Christ says, I will restore your soul all. In other words, none of his children have gone too far. None of his children have crossed a line. Listen, if you're truly a blood bought child of the living God, you have been redeemed. You have been purchased. The sins of the past, present, and future covered by the grace of God. That's not license to sin. It's not liberty to sin, but it's liberty from sin. And we're grateful to know the Father is watching and He's waiting and He's saying, Come, child. Come, my son. Come, my daughter. I'm waiting. We've got the fatted calf ready. We've got the robe ready. We've got the ring ready. We've got the shoes ready. There's going to be a celebration over the one little lost lamb who has been found, who has been brought back to the fold. There's great rejoicing in heaven. Yes, when a sinner becomes a saint, but also when a child of God returns to the Father's house. Would you come, all that are heavy laden? And then finally, Notice what Matthew 11 says. When you come unto me, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. I will give you restoration. So what do we need rest from? Let me give you this. Number one, I believe we need rest for the weary soul. That's the, the part of, of a person that's deeper than their mind, deeper than their heart, deeper than their body. That's where we're hurting today. That's what has us in crisis today. We are hurting deeper than ever before. And he says, I'm going to give rest to the weary soul. Secondly, he says, I'm going to give rest to the troubled heart. Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then thirdly, he gives rest to the anxious mind. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request 
be made known unto God. Come all that are anxious. Call. Come all that are overwhelmed. Come all that are stressed out. Come all that are filled with anxiety. And I will give you rest. And then verse 7 in this text says. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ. That's a restored soul. Listen, friend, there's never been a time that we were more anxious and more panicking and, and, and in more chaos and the calamity. I mean, it's overwhelming. And, and the Lord Jesus says, listen, you think you've been through something? I've been through the death experience of the cross. I've been through the experience of being separated from my father. I've been through the experience of Calvary and nothing else could compare. Golgotha, the place of the skull, while they crucified thousands. It wasn't the cross that made Jesus famous but it's Jesus who made the cross famous. He said I've been through hell and back for you. They put me in a tomb but I came out of that tomb victorious and I came out victorious so that you might come out of that which as you grip like a grave. You might feel like you are in the very grips of despair at death's door it's spiritually and your soul is crying out. It's broken and it's aching and he said come to me and I'll give you peace that passes all understanding. In other words, when it doesn't make sense up here, somehow it makes sense in here. When everything around me is falling apart, everything within me is hanging in there. Friend, I want you to know the Lord Jesus wants to restore your soul today. Maybe you've got some addiction in your life. Let Christ restore your soul. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that's been broken and it needs to be restored. Maybe today there needs to be some conversation. First with the Savior and then with someone else to help restore them and their relationship. Let me just say to you as we close, sometimes the church gets a little big for her britches if you know what I mean. You see, there was another son of the prodigal and the father. It was a rebellious son in a whole different way. For when his younger brother came and the father embraced him, the older son was indignant. He was furious. He was angry at his brother and angry at his father. I wonder sometimes, does the church believe in the restoration of souls? Or do we shoot our own wounded, cast out those who have fallen? I'm thankful to know that I don't stand before any man, but I stand before the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who redeemed me. He's the only one that paid my sin debt and my penalty and my payment and my price. And he's the only one who will come and redeem me when I stray. I pray every day, Lord, keep me close to the fold. I don't want to be that sheep that wanders that you have to leave the 90 and 9 to come after. I don't want to be so close to the shepherd that I can feel his breath upon my brow. His arms around me tightly. Wherever you are in your relationship. First, if you've never experienced the saving grace of God, this can be the day of salvation for you. But if you're in that situation where you say, I'm saved, but boy, I need my soul restored. Jesus is inviting you to come unto him. And you can do that right there. That's one thing that technology makes possible that we can share the gospel to thousands of people at one time, but that God can do business with us individually. He's not limited by space. He's not limited by crisis and ordinances. If he's speaking to your heart today, whether it's for salvation or whether it's the shepherd coming and saying, won't you come back to the flock? Would you reach up and take a hold of those arms? Noticing that they're nail scars in those hands. And you say, well, preacher, how could he ever take me back after what I've done? How could he ever redeem me after as far as I've gone? When those hands come to pick you up, just look into them and you'll see how. 
because he's paid the price so that you and I don't have to. At times, I feel guilty that it's not right for Christ just to take me back when I fail him. Certainly, I should have to do something to make it up to him. You see, that's why there is a cross because God knew that there was nothing that you and I could ever do to make it up to him. That's why it's called grace. We celebrate this grace. We celebrate the redemption of the Savior. Jesus established a couple of ordinances for us, baptism and then the Lord's Supper. Hours before he would go to the cross, Jesus would, for one last time, celebrate the Passover with his disciples. He would take bread and break it and pass it to each one of them saying, this is my body broken for you. This is my body broken for you. Today we pause and as if the hands of our Savior was distributing the little wafer or the bread or whatever it might be that you have. Imagine those same hands. There are no nail scars in them yet, but in hours there would be. And Jesus would break that bread and say, this is my body given for you, that I might redeem you, that I might save you, that I might rescue you, and that I might restore you. What an awesome line in the sand to establish today. To say, Lord, thank you for the redemption and the restoration. As he broke the bread, he blessed it. God, I pray that you and the power of the Holy Spirit would speak in this moment to people who need to be restored. God, it is a beautiful picture of a person who's fallen and then the Savior picks them up when we're broken and you mend us, when we're hurting and you heal us. Lord, may we never forget the sacrifice made possible because of the body hung upon a cross, laid in a tomb that walked out of that tomb in three days. Thank you for the power of redemption in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, as often, often as you take of this sacrament, this bread that represents my body, do so in remembrance of me. When Jesus took the cup, And he poured the wine or the juice into the cup. He said something that I think we don't really get the magnitude. He said, this is the blood of the New Testament. This is my blood, my pure atoning blood. They were familiar with blood sacrifices. They had seen it all of their lives. But he said, it is my blood being poured out for you. And don't miss this part. He didn't say, this is my blood that was or that will be. But he said, it's a living flow. It is my blood that is poured out for you continually. Salvation does not give us an excuse to sin or liberty to go and sin. But we realize that when we are the redeemed of the Lord, that even the sins that I commit in the future... There's already blood sufficient, already grace sufficient being poured out now for that sin. Someone asked me the other day, they said, well, what happens if, if I sin and before I have a chance to ask for forgiveness or to repent of it, what if I die? And I think about the guy that stepped out in front of the bus and right before he was hit, he said something he shouldn't have said. And then it's all over. God doesn't play games. He gives grace. Life is not about gotcha. It's not about do we die before we have a chance to say, I'm sorry, God. But it's about our Savior saying, paid in full. 
when he said it is enough, it is finished, paid in full to tell us die. He said, every sin that you've committed, the sins that you're committing and the sins that you will commit are forgiven because of my blood, my atoning blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole, restored again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for the blood sacrifice and the fact that it's a living flow, living water to those that are, Lord, that those that have souls that are thirsty. Lord, it is the redemptive power of the cross and the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. And we thank you that it was poured out and spilt out because you loved us so much. May we never, ever get over the gift you made possible on Calvary's cross in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, as often as you drink of the cup, do so in remembrance of me. Beloved, as we come to the end of our Facebook Live service, I'm gonna ask you to spend some time personally just thinking about what does restoration of our soul mean to you? I do believe if we will allow the Holy Spirit to restore us, tomorrow could be different. A peace and a grace and a joy and a contentment that we've never had or maybe it's been a long, long time. I love restoration. Over the years, I've restored furniture. I've restored houses. I've restored cars and even a couple of motorcycles. But there's certain things that the preacher can't restore. Your mama can't restore and your daddy can't restore. It's so deep within a person that only the one that put it there, the soul, only he can restore it. Won't you let him restore your soul today? Click on the link that'll be just below this video. You're going to be blessed by this amazing music. So reach out to us. Let us know how we can pray for you, how we can help you, and how God is using this time to touch your heart. Be restored, my beloved. I love you, and I look forward to seeing you. The camp will be open all day today. You come, put something on the cross down there by the water. Come spend time with the Lord. God bless you. Have a great Easter in spite of it all.